program is jointly supported in part by grants from the King County Arts Commission, the Washington State Arts Commission, and also the City of Seattle and the Seattle Arts Commission. music trying to find something but I can't find it damn it oh no this is terrible this always happens to me when I try to find something I just lose all my pens this is why I burn so much music I remember I could compose myself out of every place I lived there must be over 500 pieces because it's a tremendous amount of music To conclude our afternoon concert, music by Alan Hovhannes, a performance by Andre Kostelanitz and his symphony orchestra. Alan Hovhannes, born on this day in Somerville, Massachusetts in the year 1911, a composer who has received the accolades and praise of critics, musicians, and of course audiences all over the country, indeed the world. Hovhannes' music has been played by such illustrious orchestras as the Royal Philharmonic in England, the Tokyo and Minneapolis orchestras. His music has been commissioned by many film and television producers and by individuals such as Leopold Stokowski and Yehudi Menuhin. I'm low, ready for our birthday tribute this evening to yes, Alan Hovannis. to remind everyone of that. That's coming up this evening at 6 o'clock, and those who would like to meet Alan Hovannis have a chance to do that. I, I like to write really for everybody. I, I don't like writing for a very intellectually snobbish small group. He's so well known around the country, he's so well known in Europe, and yet he's not well known in Seattle. He's a great composer. It's great to play. He strikes me as a person who reached the enlightenment. And I like the oriental cast to it, the mid-eastern approach. His Armenian thoughts. I find his music very inspiring, more than any other composer in this century. A living composer, a world-class composer. Yes. My wife, Nako, is the joy of my life, and uh, I'm very happy when she's with me. When I was four years old, I made my first attempt to write music. And uh, my mother said it wasn't any good, so I lost interest in music. And uh, at seven, I heard the first good piece of music, uh, a song of Schubert. And I thought, well, Schubert wrote that melody, wrote the, that music. Uh, perhaps I should write down uh, the uh, music I hear in my head, uh, since I was always hearing melodies in my head. And so I started writing music from, from that time on. So uh, uh, this is a piece I wrote when I was about uh, eight or nine. My father taught chemistry at Tufts College in Boston. I, I think they were always worried that I wouldn't do my schoolwork. These paintings were done automatically by uh, this uh, mediumistic psychic, who I call always my teacher. I experimented a good deal with mediumistic people when we had our experimental seances. I think one's uh, talent is an accumulation of what one brings over from many different, different lives and different experiences. I had some kind of life, apparently, that's been, that I've been told uh, at the time of Leonardo da Vinci in Florence. I feel I've lived before and I hope I'm doing better than I did before. A few years ago, uh, I couldn't successfully write what I wanted to. 
uh, I had lost my contact with the angelic world, perhaps, where music comes from, where uh, those better than we exist. Uh, I felt that I, I couldn't really contact them. I was too disturbed mentally. Um, I tried everything, psychiatrists, everything. It all failed, all false. And I wrestled with it. I fought with it one time when I was alone one night. And, and, I, and I beat it somehow. I, I somehow managed to uh, succeed in the second movement of the 28th symphony. From that time on, everything came fast. Suddenly, the 27th, 28th, 29th, 30th, 31, 32, all, and the string quartet, all right together. Uh, I seem to remember what my teacher used to tell me. He used to tell me, when you work, uh, imagine yourself surrounded by infinite space, uh, so that, uh, of course, this whole earth is a little speck in the, uh, surrounded by infinite universe. And this thought, I think, has influenced uh, my fourth symphony and some of my other works, where I have star-like sounds accompanying uh, a long, uh, perhaps a religious or priest-like melody, and uh, maybe why Carl Sagan uh, used my fourth symphony, the first movement and the last movement, in, in his cosmos. made symphonies and concerts in India, Japan, and uh, Russia, and in Europe, too. And now I'm going to San Jose to hear the first performance of my Mount St. Helens symphony. I'm crazy because I can't get my best ideas out. Things come so fast, it's like suddenly something comes through the room, like a, like a tornado, and you have to catch it. And uh, if you don't catch it, it's gone. So that's, that's something I have to be very alert for when I carry a notebook all the time. <laughs> I'm very glad that George Cleave is the one who's doing the Mount St. Helens Symphony. Uh -huh. Because this is a dramatic symphony and mm -hmm. very passionate. And, mm -hmm. and uh, he likes that kind of thing. This time you have to do it in a two rehearsals. Yeah. And I have to really do it tonight. I've always heard the orchestra and everything, all details in my head. But then, as soon as I've composed a symphony, I forget all about it. I don't remember a thing about it. And I'm always scared for fear it's not what I thought it was. Are you excited? Are you? to resonate a little bit more. Try, try it once. Well, let me hear it now. Well, I like that better, okay? I wish you like that. Well, could I hear the first one again? <laughs> The third movement of the uh, Mount St. Helens Symphony is the catastrophic volcano and its aftermath.
I know I ask impossible things, but just do the best you can. <laughs> okay, anything else that you wanted us to go over? Yes? Great. Thank you very much. Great. I think this is one of my best works, if not the best, of the symphonies, really. I hope so. <laughs> I'm, very, I'm very pleased. That I, I didn't know it was this beautiful. I, I didn't realize it. The critics in California seem to like me very well. But uh, even when I've had a standing ovation, I've had the critics absolutely say this is the worst thing that's ever written. Mentally, they're fleas. They make me itch, but I don't care. My music keeps getting played in spite of the critics. Alan Hovannis and his wife uh, come here regularly, several times a week, and um, he always has his very favorite cake, his sinful cake or the chocolate decadence. He always writes his music very beautifully, he's very quiet, and he just sits there and writes, it just flows out of him on a regular basis. And he, um, um, I wrote part of the Mount St. Helens Symphony here. He just had the uh, premiere, I guess, in San Jose, California, and uh, I, he had a standing ovation. I, I read in the paper, so we're real happy. The tremendous destruction of the eruption can make one very pessimistic because of the uncertainty of life and all that. But if one looks further and realizes our human life is like that of an insect, very small compared with the life of the Earth, and uh, what builds our Earth and creates the renewal and resurrection are the life-giving forces that are building the mountain that pierce the clouds of heaven. All my life I've loved mountains. I never believed in climbing mountains in a sense of conquering, but as a kind of religious journey. Mountains are most important in my music. They're my main inspiration. That's why I came to Seattle to be near them. In the program notes for Mysterious Mountain, I said mountains are like pyramids. They're sort of between two worlds, the land of the gods and, and the human land. David Lovell now leads the Anchorage Symphony at Alan Hovannis's Mysterious Mountain. Mr. Hovannis is in the audience and will be introduced after the performance. Anchorage Symphony Orchestra performing Alan Hovannis's Mysterious Mountain. Conductor David LaBelle asks the composer to come up on stage. <laughs> Alan Hovannis, one of the most prolific composers of our time, currently lives in the Seattle area. I wrote, I wrote Starry Night in the restaurant right in the corner here at the counter. I was having breakfast there. The trouble was there was one man, one, one truck driver on one side of me and another one on the other side of me, and I was kind of cramped. And so I had trouble keeping Starry Night out of the food I was eating. But then I forget everything when I, when I actually get them to decide on the music. The music comes, or the music just suddenly comes. I wasn't even sure whether this music was Starry Night or what it was. But uh, then I felt, of course, this, this fits this particular thing. 
I was writing a, a string quartet at the same time and had just finished two symphonies. So uh, this was not for either of those. And uh, I had this in mind, so uh, that was it. friend from England sent me a picture of young Sibelius. Oh, really? I keep it with my cat pictures. Oh, sure. We corresponded through the rest of his life. He wrote many mm -hmm. letters to, to me, and I like Sibelius better than anybody else in this century. <laughs> All the other composers make fun of him because they're so jealous. They can't stand a composer who's popular. And they make fun of him because he wrote Finlandia. You know, Stravinsky could be a very nasty man, and he said that he, he, he uh, always made fun of Sibelius. He said, he's Finlandia, but why does he forget the seven symphonies and all the great tone poems? All the young men wanted to be the Stravinsky of the next 50 years. I said, why don't you be yourself? But are you a friend? I don't care. Are you sure? I don't care. I mean, Stravinsky is a great genius. Yes, he is. We know that. He's tremendous. But spiritually, he isn't. That's what he lacks. So they say Sibelius isn't intellectual, mm -hmm. but uh, he's much more than that. Mm -hmm. Well, I suppose we better rehearse the music I wrote for Bill's wedding. Okay. If you feel like it. Bill is Hinako's son. And I feel very much as a father, and so I'm very happy to uh, have the honor of making the music for him. are filled this night with great happiness, for this is their wedding day. They come before you at the altar of love. To me, Japanese women are the most beautiful. I always wanted to marry a Japanese girl, and unfortunately, earlier in life, I always found myself not married to a Japanese girl. Marriage and family is perhaps the most important thing in the world, and uh, I felt that way ever since I've known Hinako. I've always loved Japan so much, and that's the reason I came to the Northwest, finally. I'm an Armenian composer who went east instead of west. I think Japan is the most artistic country in the world, and 
The Northwest is the closest to it. I learned so much, played so many ancient instruments in Japan, and my work called Japanese Woodprints is one of the works which expresses not so much my influence from Japanese music as Japanese life and, and uh, Japanese paintings. Hinako has brought out the very best in my life as far as music is concerned. I've tried to imitate her voice, I think, consciously or unconsciously somehow, and as somebody said, my music's gotten higher and higher. Good, that was good, that was a good F. No, that was all right, that was good. That was okay. You are going to have a fantastic experience with this man. He is a wonderful human being, and uh, he is known the world over right now, and I think it's a great honor for us to have him here this morning. Alan, great pleasure to have you here. <laughs> uh, it's a great pleasure to conduct uh, the Youth Symphony. I, uh, it was uh, your orchestra that brought me out here to Seattle in the first place, and uh, finally I came out to live here because uh, I love the mountains, and uh, your orchestra was wonderful then, and it is now. So. I certainly appreciate it. I've written a lot of music, too, for young people. I always enjoy working with young people very much. Uh, this symphony I'm dedicating to my grandmother, who died a long time ago, my Armenian grandmother. And uh, she went through the massacres and apparently carried a picture of, my, uh, of me when I was first born through that successfully. So uh, I owe her something. <laughs> No, that's a chord that doesn't belong in this sequence. You know, we don't have the kind of instruments in the modern orchestra that I like to see, like they had in ancient Egypt, for instance, thousands of harps and that sort of thing. Berlioz was crazy, and I'm crazy too. Probably Berlioz was an incarnation of a Chinaman, and uh, uh, perhaps I'm from Egypt and uh, 4,000 years ago, and I've come back and I want more. I want mysterious sounds. So keep this very mysterious. But watch the chord changes. Okay.
That's very good. Thank you. This program is jointly supported in part by grants from the King County Arts Commission, the Washington State Arts Commission, and the National Endowment for the Arts in Washington, D.C. Also, the City of Seattle and the Seattle Arts Commission. Thank you.